Shalom, and welcome to another edition here on the Genesis 49 page, where we say no to vague interpretation and we give thorough breakdowns. Genesis 49ers, we back, but never moving backwards, here to put Israel on the atlas. Y'all know the slogan. We say no to vague interpretations, and we give thorough breakdowns. Today's video is going to be a hot topic. It's going to be a deep lecture. It's going to be something to clear the air, so to speak, to give clarity. Because many years, there has been uh, accusation on the he break faith and on those that practice it that we're misogynistic that there's no place for the woman within our tradition and our teachings and our uh history and our scriptures that has been a notion that has been pushed by proponents of egypt proponents of afrocentric thinking to draw women away from the truth and draw them away from the israelites and draw them to their regime or their Israel, their uh, comedic thought or Afrocentric thought. And what happens is a lot of our people, they move on emotion. They don't move on logic. So they were like, oh, you're right. Yeah, that's not for the women. That's not for the women. Now, I have said in prior videos, prior conversations and discussions, the Bible is not against women in general. It's against wicked women, just like it's against wicked and evil men, those that commit iniquity. That's who is against. Now, it gives you a chance and has mercy. The Most High has mercy on you and wants to give you chance after chance so you can repent and come back into the fold and grow uh, as an Israelite. But just to plain out say that the Bible is misogynistic and those who teach it are misogynistic and that the Bible has, there's no place for women and never talks about women, you're misled. Now, the first slide I'm going to deal with is going to be a statement Jabari made during a debate against Divine Prospect on signing the TV. And this is after the Q&A or during the Q&A the, after the debate had took have taken place. And um, some comments were made. And it's funny how condescending Jabari can be. He will act like he's the authority of the scriptures and he read it four times and he, he knows so much more. And he, he and sometimes he, he tricks himself and confuses himself to, and misconstrues of the knowledge of the Israelites that he thinks he's teaching us something. So he brings up Thecla and say, oh, they took the woman, the, the, the uh, feminine influence out of the Bible. You know, they, that's why they removed Thecla. Before we even start into the clip, that's not why they removed Thecla. There was other reasons. Uh, one of the reasons was that she left her husband, and that's an unchristian principle. It's written in Corinthians. You're bound to your husband to death, you see. That was one of the, the claims against her. It's another one. It wasn't because they were just hating against women. And, and for someone to make that statement, he does not know the scriptures. He either doesn't know or he's, he's being conniving, and his bias is preventing him from telling the truth. So he's either ignorant or he's just being biased. Now we're going to get into the clip and then we're going to go into the presentation and we're going to show you that this, this guy, man, he has no idea. He has no idea what he's talking about or he's just being biased and he doesn't want the truth to come out. Now let's get to the clip as you can see on the screen. Again, this is Jabari versus Divine Prospect on Sun at a TV. Uh, the minute marker is three hours and 51 minutes and 42 seconds. Now listen to what he says. Of ancient Africa exists. And so I'm going to say to you, I'm going to say to you that, shh, that the Christian tradition, you, have you read the book of Thecla? That was removed in 328 AD. It was in the corpus of books. They removed it and they said why they removed it. Because the role of the feminine was too prominent. So what I'm challenging you, all, challenging you also to do, lovingly challenging you to do, is to say, perhaps what I've been given is not complete. And that in order for me to truly move forward in power in any tradition, I have to make sure that there weren't people that altered what I could read so they can control my behavior. 
So you have to look at Thecla. You have to look at the Ebionites, who actually believed that there was, there was actually the, um, the, the, the um, Holy Father, the Holy Son, and the ghost was feminine. Again, he, he speaks condescendingly like, oh, what I'm telling you is you did not know about it. You didn't read about Thecla. You didn't know. And they took it out because the feminine role was too prominent. I'm going to tell the audience right now that's a bunch of hogwash because if you read the scriptures there were greater women than thecla there was women with higher stature than thecla period so he's either ignorant or he's just being biased just to prove his point and that's the point of this lecture and also to give you sisters hope and you sisters um education on your foremothers because it's a lot that that is being a lot of information that's being slept on and not being taught that we need to make sure we give our sisters a corpus of knowledge as well we can't just leave them out we can't have airheads for wives we can't have airheads for daughters they have to be enlightened and educated as well now let's get into the presentation because again jabari he, he, would, he would make it seem that way just so he can draw you into the comedic atmosphere, if you will, or the, the climate of, the, 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 of Kemet or, or the teachings of Kemet and say, oh, this is for women. Even though if you look into a lot of the teachings of Kemet, you would probably be like, oh, that's kind of misogynistic too. So it's the pot calling kettle black again. But no, don't question Kemet. Anyway, let's get to the next slide. And out of the gate, we're going to deal with a queen, a queen that has Israelite tides, that is a descendant of an Israelite. It's of the lineage of Haram. And this queen is Ditto. Now, Ditto was not her birth name. Ditto was given to her on the, on the island in the Mediterranean Sea. Ditto means stranger because she was fleeing her homeland, right? Which was Tyre. She was fleeing, well, Zidon. It was, she was fleeing Zidon. Because of the altercation she had with her brother. When you look up her history. Again, I told you. When I, at Genesis 49, we're going to plant the seed. But we want you to add to the sentence. We want you to actually research these individuals. Research Ditto the Queen of Carthage. The founder. Matter of fact, she was the founder of Carthage. She was of the lineage of Haram. She was a relative of King Ahab and Jezebel, which is her great aunt. She founded the city of Carthage in eight in the eighth century, eight, around eight fourteen BC. Scholars scholars say, Alyssa Strong's Hebrew four seven seven means oath of God or salvation of God. It's also how you get the female uh, uh, rendition of uh, uh, Alicia, which is Elizabeth, right? So she had a Punic or Hebraic name. So she was the queen of Carthage found her that land and she brought her, her her cohorts with her her soldiers with her and they inhabited that land and began to cultivate that land she did that a woman a, a black woman did that and, and and again black is just an adjective she has dark skin so that's why i said that she's an israelite she comes from the israelite heritage but now you're going to ask me genesis 49 is just show how is she is Israelite if she comes from the lineage of haram aha i did a video about this uh, um, about eight months ago about King Haram being an Israelite. A lot of people sleep on the information and they overlook it. But we're going to get into it. We're going to break it down how this prominent woman, Ditto the Queen of Carthage or Alyssa the Queen of Carthage, the founder of Carthage, this prominent woman, right? How she uh, descends from Israelites. I'm going to give you her genealogy. So next slide, we're dealing with Tyree. It says, I will however cite yet a further witness, Menander of Ephesus. This author has recorded the events of each reign in the Hellenic and non-Hellenic countries alike and has taken the trouble to obtain inf his information in each case from the national records, writing of, <coughs> excuse me, on the kings of Tyree. When he comes to Haram, he expresses himself thus. And that's why Joseph, this is Josephus against Apion. Right? If you had a complete works, Josephus against Apion is usually in the back. Now, this is why Josephus is so important to history. And a lot of uh, people that study history uh, accredit him because he gives the, these missing documents light. He gives them the light. 
because the little we do know about these missing documents is found in his works. Now, let's see what he says about Haram. And again, this is still against Apion. It says, on the death of Abi Balus, the kingdom passed to his son Haram, who lived 53 years and reigned 34. He laid the embankment of the broad place, dedicated the golden pillar in the temple of Zeus, went and cut down cedar wood on the mount called Libanus for timber for the roofs of the temples, demolished the ancient temples and built new shrines dedicated to Hercules and Astarte. That of Hercules he erected first in the month of Perutus. He uh, undertook a campaign against the people of Utica who refused to pay their tribute and did not return home till he had reduced them to submission. Under his reign lived Abdenum, a young lad who always succeeded in mastering the problem set by Solomon, king of Jerusalem. So we know this is Haram that was contemporaneous with Solomon. And I'm reading you through all this to give you the foundation of Carthage and her lineage from Haram. Ditto's lineage from Haram. The period intervening between this king and the foundation of the Carthage is computed as follows. On the death of Haram, the throne passed on to the son Balbasar, who lived 43 years and reigned 17. His successor, Abdastratus, lived 39 years and reigned 9. The four sons of his nurse conspired against him and slew him. The eldest of these met through Sartus, son of Delestardis mounted the throne and lived 54 years and reigned 12. He was followed by his brother, Astarmus, who lived, and it's the next page, 58 years and reigned 9. He was slain by his brother, Feles, who seized the throne and reigned 8 months, having reached the age of 50. When he was slain by Ithabal, priest of Astarte, who lived 48 years and reigned 32, he was succeeded by his son, Balasor, who lived 45 years and reigned 6. He, in turn, was succeeded by his son, Metun, who lived 32 years and reigned 29, and he by Pike Malion, who lived 58 years and reigned 47. It was in the seventh year of his reign that his sister took flight and built the city of Carthage in Libya. Now, this is the point. That sister is Alyssa, commonly known as Ditto. She found it, and she comes from the line of Hiram, and we're going to deal with who Hiram was, what was his pedigree. It says the whole period from the accession of Haram to the foundation of Carthage thus amounts to 155 years and eight months. And since the Temple of Jerusalem was built the 12th year of King Haram's reign, 143 years and eight months elapsed between the erection of the temple and the foundation of Carthage. What needs there to add further Phoenician evidence? The, the agreement of the witness as well be seen affords strong confirmation of their veracity. So he's telling you this is a true account that she went into, and she came from the lineage of Hiram, and she went to Libya and, and, and found it and built the city of Carthage. The agreement of the witness as well, as will be seen, affords strong confirmation of their veracity. Of course, our ancestors arrived in the country long before the temple was built, for it was not until, that, until they had conquered the whole land that they erected it. The facts derived from the sacred books have been clearly stated in my archaeology. So a list of commonly known as Ditto. So we, we went to her lineage to show and prove that she descends from Haram, seed, his line. Now let's deal with Haram. This is Antiquities of the Jews, eight, uh, book 8, 76, line 76. Josephus, right? It says, now Solomon sent for an artificer out of Tyre, whose name was Haram. He was by birth of the tribe of Naphtali. That's an Israelite tribe on the mother's side, for she was of that tribe, but his father Ur of the stock of the Israelites. So, again, Haram was an Israelite. So his descendants, going all the way down to his, his, his great, 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 great granddaughter, Ditto, the queen, the prominent woman who found Carthage, the queen of Carthage was an Israelite because she comes from the line of Haram. Moving on, so we proved that this sister, this prominent queen, found Carthage and she is an Israelite, right? So, again, remember <laughs> Jabari said, Oh, they want to remove the, the feminine influence, it was the feminine influence was too prominent. It doesn't even stop with her, but I just want to start it, start the lecture off with a, with a uh, banger, man. I wanted to start it off right with a queen. To show you Jabari doesn't know the material. 
He doesn't know the material in question. He doesn't know the tradition in question. So Haram was an Israelite making her an Israelite because she descends from his line. Now, I'm going to give you more tithes to Zidon. 1 Kings 16, 31, it says, And it came to pass as, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ephbal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Now, this is giving you two things. It's giving you who he married, what tribe she came from, and also the fact that we failed because we wasn't supposed to be marrying these tribes, but we did. The law was that we weren't supposed to, but in history, that's what we did. And that's how Haram came about, and that's how, you know, eventually Ditto came about, or Elissa came about. Judges 131 says, Neither did Asher, drive, Asher is a tribe of Israel, one of the tribes of Israel, drive out the inhabitants of Akko, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, so is, that's the Zidonians, nor Alab, nor of Akzib, nor of Hebla, nor of Ak. Aknik nor a Rahab. They didn't drive all of them out. So they began to what? Intermingle. They took on some of their customs. They married them. And that also answers a lot of people that come up with the foolish uh, notion that, oh, the Ebos, Yorubas, and all these people you saying are Israelites. They have hermetic customs. They have different traditions. They have African. Of course, they have African traditions. A lot of our people cling to their customs and follow their ways. It doesn't change up their genetic makeup or their pedigree or, or, or their uh, genealogy. That doesn't change the fact that the blood that flows within inside of them is Israelite blood. But anyway, that's for another topic. We're here for the women, for the prominent women. So again, we're showing you more ties to the prominent queen, Ditto or Elissa of Carthage. She found Carthage and she reigned over Carthage. She was the first to reign over Carthage because she discovered it. She found it. She built it. Now let's deal with more honorable women. Uh, 2 Kings 11 and 1 says, When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the sea royals. So she didn't want anybody to uh, progress into being a king. This resulted in Athaliah being queen of Israel for, I believe, five years. So we did have a queen that reigned solo by herself, no king by her side. She wasn't a co regent, she was the regent. She ruled over Israel. There was no co regency at this time. It was just her. So if anybody tell you there was no queens in Israel, they don't know the history. They don't know the scriptures. That's why we have to up our, our scholarship and our study game. A, a lot of Israelites, I, I hate to say this, a lot of you, um, you're a surface level Israelite. You need to dig deeper. I'm just going to say that and keep going. Second Kings 11 verse 2. But Jehosheba, Sheba, Jehosheba, the daughter of King Jerome, Jerome, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's son, which was slain, and they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. So, this righteous sister, this honorable sister, Jehosheba in 2 Kings 11 and 2, saved the son of Ahaziah, Joash, who will later on become the king Joash. And she saved him and preserved him and raised him and kept him from Athalia because Athalia was going to make sure no, none of these men from, the, from that lineage would, ru would uh, rule over Israel. And this was a great work for her. That never happened. King Joash would never have been king. He would have never been able to uh, win those wars he won and win a lot of that land back for the, for the uh, northern kingdom of Israel. So next slide. Now, we're going to deal with another queen. Remember, he said, oh, they just want to get rid of all of the <coughs> all of the uh, prestigious women. These women are, are, are too prestigious. That's why they had to remove it. That's why it's not in your custom. That's why you don't know about it. No, you don't know about our, our history. You don't know about the great women of our tradition. You don't know. So we're going to deal with Queen Kahina, and to in order to get the information about her, we're going to go to Travels in North Africa by Nahum Sluts, page 309. And it reads, as I have shown elsewhere, their primitive Judaism was dominated by families of priests. The Kahina, their queen, was herself a priestess and the daughter of a Kohen. So she was of the tribe of Levi to be the daughter of the Kohen. 
It is the history of this queen which has never been treated in any Jewish work that I'm about to relate. For while traveling in her country, I was able to ascertain the great role which she played. We are dealing now with a legendary, but with a real historic character. Not with a legendary, but with a real historic character. Her history has been related by the Arab writers Ibn Khaldun in Navari, etc. The Jerua, a warrior tribe which immigrated after the Saranica massacres of 115-118, generally pitched their tents on the Jebel, the Jebel um, Moinche, a long hill stretch in the north Kinshla, and dominate the vast plains of Hercules, which the Wadnini splits into two. Their territory, which extended as far as Jebel, where a Jewish cemetery may still be seen in the capital of Bagagia. By the size of Roman and Berber ruins of this city, I found necropolis, Resembling the Gamart and the two extremities of the country of Jerul, I found two other cemeteries. Toward the 5th century, profiting by the help which they had given by the Vandals, the Jerul gained a firm hold on the country. Ours, the historian Ibn Khaldun tells us about the military strength, their knowledge of the arts of peace, and their nobility. The Jerul dominated all the Berbers of the Middle Country, supplying them a royal dynasty. And these, these great Jeruls, who were their queen? The Queen Kahina. And she gets her name from the Kohen, which is a tribe of Levi, a prestigious tribe of Levi. And where she was known to lead an army and uh, fight against the Islamic invasion. And I believe in the 7th century AD. <coughs> but you can read about Queen Kahina, another prestigious queen that's an Israelite from the Levite tribe, Kohen. Next slide. Let's deal with queens. Since somebody, oh, there's no queens in the Bible. Let's get Songs of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 8. Verse eight. There are three score queens. Wait, three score what? Queens. Now, a score is what? 20, right? So there's 80 queens and four score concubines. I mean, there's 60 queens and four score concubines, 80 concubines, versions without number. So why would it mention queens if Israel didn't deal with queens? Song of Solomon 6 and 9. My dove, my underfowl is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bear her. The daughter saw her and blessed her. The queens and the concubines, and they praised her. So, again, we see that phraseology being used within the Bible, within the Hebrew. We see it there. We see it being uh, within use. So, brothers, you got to get off that trying to say, oh, well, queen is an evil. Queen is not an evil word. It's just a title of prestige. That's all it is. You can't have a king without having a queen, prince, and princess. You know how it goes. Next slide. Now, let's deal with Judith. Again, Jabari said that getting away, like, she was too fem. The, the, the position was too prestigious. It, she was a woman with... with such prestige so they had to take her out of the canon wait a minute judith is found in the in the books it's found in the apocrypha by the way and guess what she did she saved judea from the tyranny of Holofernes, a general of nebuchadnezzar right she even beheaded him and prevented bethula from being seized and enslaved via assyria that's what she's known for. That's what she's praised for and glorified for. Again, Judith 8 and 31 says, Therefore now pray thou for us, because thou art a godly woman, and the Lord will send us rain to fill our cisterns, and we shall faint no more. The people of Israel went to Judith and asked her for her prayer. You're talking about a position of prestige. You're talking about a feminine role. That was in high honor. All of the Israelites went to her for prayer. So what, what does that make her? A prophetess, man. A priestess, whatever you want to call it. So the Bible does deal with these type of women. The Bible does record the acts of these righteous women. These priests, these prophetess and queens. Our scriptures, our texts, and our recordings do talk about these women. So don't let no commission... Afrocentric BS you out of your history and out of your tradition and your ancestors and your foremothers. So let's keep it going. Judith 16, 
Verses 20 through 25 says, So the people continued feasting in Jerusalem before the sanctuary for the space of three months, and Judith rena- remained with them. After this time, everyone returned to his own inheritance, and Judith went to Bethulia and remained in her own possession. It was in her time honorable in all the country. She was respected. She was famous. And many desired her, but none knew her all the days of her life after that. Uh, Manasseh, her husband, was dead and was gathered to his people, so she decided to be single uh, after her husband died. It says, but she increased more and more in honor and waxed old in her husband's house, being 105 years old, and made her maid free. So she died in Bethulia and, and buried, and they buried her in the cave of her husband Manasseh. And the house of Israel lamented her seven days, and before she died, she did distribute her goods to all them that was nearest of kindred to Manasseh, her husband, and to them that were nearest of her kindred. And there was none that made the children of Israel any more afraid in the days of Judith, nor a long time after her death, because <coughs> she her reputation as being a godly woman stayed there for a long time, as long as she lived and after she died. It's like, don't go over there. We got that godly woman over there. She's going to pray for their behalf. And the Most High is going to, um, you know, intercede. And she and she beheaded a man. She beheaded a general. This is a very famous woman. Prestigious. So what is Jabari talking about? Oh, they removed this. Y'all don't know about Thecla. Thecla is a small spectacle in the spectrum compared to these other women we've been mentioning she's 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 small she she's small to ditto she's small compared to judith she's she's small compared to queen kohina who helped fight against the islamic regime and led her army and was the queen of israel she's small compared to them not saying she's not important, but you're trying to claim that, oh, you guys don't know this. You don't know that. What about Thecla? Well, we, we already know about Judith, Kohina, and Dito. Now, let's keep talking. Let's keep going. <clears throat> How do you not know about this? This is, this is my question. Esther, she was a what? She was a queen. Esther or Hadessa spoiled Haman the Agite's plan to massacre the Israelites within the Persians' jur- jurisdiction. And she used her power and influence as a queen to decree the Holy Day Purim. Now, that's powerful because she enacted a high holy day. A holy day that we keep to this day, Purim. We celebrate Purim, Purim because of our foremother Esther. She enacted that, that decree and that law. She used her power and her influence as being a queen. Esther's 9 and 1 says, Now in the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put into execution, and the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, now it was turned, turned to the country that the Jews had ruled over them that hated them, because Esther interceded, was able to spoil Hammond's plan, and we were allowed to war with Hammond and the Agites and rid them out of the land because of Esther, the queen. That's a high prestigious role. Esther's 9 verse 25. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letters that his wicked device, which he devised against the Jews, should return upon his own head and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. And that's talking about Hammond the Agite and his sons. Esther came before the king and was able to persuade him. And the decree in the decree of Esther, not, uh, chapter 9, verse 32, and the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. She's the reason why you got the high holy day Purim. Yes, a woman is the reason why you celebrate one of your holy days. And the what faith? The Judaic and Hebraic faith. The faith that's so misogynistic, that hates women, that's against women. But we have plenty of righteous, godly women throughout the text and our scriptures and our history. Don't let these hotepas have you step away from your true heritage. Now, again, for the sisters watching, let's keep going. Deborah. 
Now, everybody talks about Deborah. We know about Deborah, but, that, but that's bring her out. Because Judith was really like Deborah. She was like a judge of Israel. She was a prominent prophetess, just like Deborah. Now, let's read about Deborah. She led Israel to victory against King Jabin of Canaan, who oppressed Israel for 20 years. She is a prominent prophetess and ruler of Israel's history. Judges 4, chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel and Mount Ephraim. And the children of, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. She was a ruler of Israel. That's how prominent her position in Israel was. They came to her. Deborah, we need, we, we need rain. We're in a famine. Deborah, what are, you, what are we going to do? The enemy's coming. We need you to intercede for us so we can get you know, strength and courage to take down the enemy from Yah. But according to Jabari's narrative, this isn't in the Bible. This shouldn't be there. They should have removed it from the canon. Get out of here, man. So that's the, the board. Let's deal with Huldah. Huldah in 2 Kings 22 and 13 and 17. It says, Go ye inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all of Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this, of this book, to do according unto all which is written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest and Hakim, Hakam, and Abor and Shaphan and Ahashiah went unto who died the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem and in college, and they commune with her. This is a priest, somebody that's high prestige and has a position himself. He's going to a woman, a prophetess, concerning the words of this book that is found. I said, look, decipher this. What does this mean? Uh, we, 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 need, we need your insight, Huldah. And she said, unto them, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, tell the man that sent you to me, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah have read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. So they went to a prophetess. She, she gave them the lowdown on the scriptures. She said, this is what this means. I got this. They went to her. So she had to have a reputation in Israel for them to even consider her. But there's no prominent women in, 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 in our uh, tradition. Gravely mistaken. Gravely mistaken. Let's keep going. Now you got the four righteous women in, in Acts 21, 8, 9. Let's read it. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we, we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven and bowed with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So this is written in a text in the New Testament about these four daughters. Holy women that prophesied. Let's keep it going. Acts 18 and 26, a lot of you should be familiar with this as well. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla, Priscilla is the wife, had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And I believe this is Apollos they're dealing with. Priscilla, wait a minute, she expounded the way of God more perfectly where her husband I thought we were misogynistic and our women did not um, engage in these different in these type of matters. Give me a break. Let's go on. We got Athrai. Now, the works of Athrai have been lost. The little we do know about her is from the Chronicles of Jeremiel. And through the Chronicles of Jeremiel, it says, Concerning them, the prophets Athrai, concerning who? The Israelites that went to Cush and went to the other side. Of, of, of the rivers of Cush going into West Africa. And that's a different topic. I already did a video about the Jews of Africa. Go check that out. But she, this prophetess wrote about them. Right? Athri, the daughter of Pusai, prophesied they should bring my offering. And this, that's from the Chronicles of Jeremiah. We got black <coughs> imagery to the right. 
because we we know we need that to combat that white supremacy. Like I always say, what uh, what's worse than white supremacy is black infidelity. I got that from a brother named Stephen Pierce. Wise brother, wise brother. Let's keep going. We got Lydia, Acts 16, 14 through 15. Another sister, another prominent sister. It says, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. It's another righteous example. Next slide. Acts 9, 36 through 40. Now, this one right here is very peculiar. And I remember I first learned about this. I was like, wow, this is something we should teach out on the street to women. To, you know, to boost their spirit, boost their morale, encourage them, exhort them. We're not all about turn down. We're about building. So Acts chapter 9, verse 30, 36 to 40 says, Now, there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. So wait a minute. Tabitha was a disciple. She was a disciple of Christ. She was a, 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 a disciple of the apostles. And it said this woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. So she did the work of the Most High. But he want to tell you, oh, her position was too prominent. What about Tabitha? And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they, they had washed, they laid her in the upper chamber. And for as much as Lydia was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping, and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. And Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turned him to the body and said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Tabitha was so important to the community, and her works were so important and pertinent to the people around her. And the other disciples, when she died, they said, let's go get Peter. Go get Peter. Get Peter. Somebody go get Peter. We cannot allow this sister to die. She is too important to our cause and our movement. But he want to tell you, oh, y'all don't know about this because she was too prominent. Tabitha is prominent. Esther is prominent. Athri is prominent. These are all prominent women's women of the Bible. Ditto. She's a prominent Israelite. Alyssa, she's a prominent Israelite. Queen Kohina, she's a prominent Israelite woman. So don't give me that BS about that. That's why in Genesis 49, as we say no to vague interpretations and we give thorough breakdowns. We're not here to play with the information. We're here to raise the ruins of David. That's all of you viewers that are listening that are black, Hispanic, Native American, or any Israelite that's scattered on the earth. We're here to rebuild our knowledge and wisdom and the spiritual and the physical. Because we also want to make works, fruits, build houses, build businesses, have an economic plan build schools we want to take it to the next level we want to make this knowledge manifest but that's for another topic as well let's get to the next slide again she was so prominent and important to the community they said let's go get peter we got a reviver she can't die on us she's way too important and this is a woman named tabitha aka dorcas solomon here we go First Kings 2 and 19. A lot of people read over this. Bathsheba therefore went unto King Solomon to speak unto him for Adonijah. And the king rose up to meet her and bowed himself unto her and sat down on his throne and caused a seat to be set for the king's mother. And she sat on his right hand. His mom was so prominent that she sat on the right hand side of Solomon. That's very prestigious. Wait, why is that in the Bible? We're so misogynistic. It's like customs, so misogynistic. We hate women. But his mother sat right next to him, on the right-hand side of him. That's 1 Kings 2 and 19. Again, don't let these whole tempers uh, fool you. 
They don't know the material. They're either biased or they're being ignorant. Exodus 1 and 15 verse 20. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shipra, and the name of the other Pua. Now, this is a, her name is also mentioned in a Brooklyn papyri for all the people that want to say, there's no, there's no uh, history that agrees with the Exodus. There's no history that Israelites were ever in Egypt. That's a lie. It's in the Brooklyn papyri. You have Israelite names in it. You have tribe names uh, found in the Brooklyn papyri. You have her name, most notably. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. <coughs> but if it be a daughter, then she, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men and children alive? And the midwives said unto uh, Pharaoh, because Hebrew women are not as Egyptian women, for they are alive, we are delivered heir. The midwives come in unto them. So they basically was trying to say, um, the babies were being born prematurely. Anyway, verse 20 says, therefore God dealt with the midwives and the people multiplied and waxed very mightly. So these women are, are known in history for saving the Israelite men, the Israelite sons, and they're prestigious and they, 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 they became famous for it in Israel. They got a name behind that. And Shipra is Strong's Hebrews 8, 2, 3, 6. It means beauty of brightness. So last but not least, let's get the last one up. Luke 2, verse 3, 6, 36. It said, and there was of Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. So again, there's another example, a prophetess named Anna. Oh, your misogynist, oh, your tradition is against women. There's no feminality and all this other, all these accusations with no merit. Exodus 15, verse 20, and Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. So Miriam, the sister of Aaron and Moses, was known as a prophetess prophetess more prestigious women more prominent women jabari talking about, oh her, her role was too prominent they're, they're afraid of look you don't know our history stay out of our stay out of our book if you're not going to study it and teach it right rightly rightly divide the word for a ch for a change you grew up a catholic and you basically your beef is not with Israelites. Your beef is with Catholics. Catholics butcher the Bible. They don't teach it correctly. Saints Day, that's not of the most high. All those things that they teach are not of the most high. Now, I pray that this was insightful and I pray that this, uh, especially the sisters, this really was made for the sisters, also for the brothers. Stop being ignorant on this topic. There were queens in Israel. There were prominent women in Israel. You need to teach this to the sisters. For the sisters, I pray that you learn something. I pray you brothers learn something. I pray that you gain something from them. I pray that you take notes. I pray that you're able to add to this information. Not only just watch and click a like and share it, but also be able to retain and add to it and build upon this. Right? We need the bricks and stones. I can only pour the foundation, but we need the bricks and stones as well, Israel. Again, like the video, share the video on the social media platforms such as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Subscribe if you haven't. I appreciate all the love within one year. We have <coughs> not even really one year. We've gotten up to 1,400 or 1,500 subscribers. So let's, let's keep it going up and up. And we're going to continue to give thorough breakdowns, good content. And we're going to build on the knowledge and the wisdom. We're going to be scholastic here on Genesis 49. So we're going to give sources, we're going to cite our sources, and we're going to stick on the knowledge